Welcome to Terror in Tandem, a podcast about finding entertainment in the macabre, hosted by the knowledgeable and lovable Laura and Richard Mathiason. Each episode, we discuss the horror genre, from books to film to TV and beyond, sometimes even from the beyond. You can find us online at terrorintandem.com and on Instagram at terrorintandem. Hello. Hey, good afternoon. Welcome. 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 Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa to you. We're saying konnichiwa because we have a very special international episode today. It's one that I'm really, really excited about. We're growing, going across the pond and then across another pond. Is the Pacific Ocean known as the pond? I mean, that's what they call it. I thought that's what they called the Atlantic Ocean. The that is, the... but can't you go that way? Sure. It's just like a bigger pond. Yeah. I mean, if we were going to go, we, would we go that oh, across the Atlantic or all the way across the country and then off across the To Pacific? LA and then to Japan. Or a direct flight. I feel like I just gave it away. Um, yeah, so today's episode, we are going to talk about Japanese horror. Yay! J-horror. Yeah. As it's known. It is? Like J-pop? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. J-H. Um, yeah. I mean, it, you know, Japanese horror is, um, it's been certainly popularized since the late 90s, early 2000s. It's when it's really entered the international consciousness, but the Japanese have been making uh, horror films for for a century, for about as long as films have been made. Well, before we get into and dive into the horror aspect of our Japanese horror episode, I thought it would be fun to maybe talk about some interesting facts about Japan. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, so I have a couple of facts. One is that um, the vending machine ratio... <laughs> In Japan is to every one person, there are approximately 23 vending machines. And you can pretty much buy anything out of a vending machine. You can buy underwear, ramen. You can buy books. Electronics. Electronics. Uh, um, all sorts coffee. of interesting soft drinks. Yeah. Like really experimental flavors. There are over 6,800 islands. Honshu is one of... Uh, the four main islands where Tokyo is located. Mm -hmm. And the other three main islands are called Hokkaido, Shikoku, and Kyushu. Kyushu. Okay. K-Y-U-S-H-U. Okay. Um, I just want to say that um, we did look up how to pronounce a lot of these things. And this is all coming from a place of love and respect yes, for the, for the we culture. I mean, we're talking are. about it because it's had such an influence on us. So we do apologize for any mispronunciation. It's all well intentioned, and we really we're don't doing mean anything our best. by it. Yeah, we're going to try our best, and we we're sorry for any names we get uh, incorrect. The two oldest people in the world live on the island of Okinawa. Hmm. They're one hundred and sixteen and one hundred and seventeen. I don't want to live that long i mean i'm not i'm afraid of death you won't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> are you gonna see to that or are you just making an observation of my lifestyle the second it's a long pause the second long i, I pause was just there. trying to think of how i would answer that yeah. um not to give myself away because this could be incriminating evidence yeah that lady just went to jail for writing a blog on how to kill her husband and then killing her husband i know which it worked. I, did it? She didn't say how to get away with it, did I she? I guess. I, I, I don't know. If like, the blog title to? was how to get away with killing your husband, then I would say it was a failure. Yes. Um, slurping your noodles isn't rude. No. And I, can we normalize that, please? It's actually as a, a shown as a sign of respect to the, to the chef. It's also just much easier to eat long noodles if you're not worried about like the occasional slurp. It's such a weird puritanical table affectation that i think we can get rid of slurp your noodles people slurp away slurp them up you're allowed to take naps on the job uh, I... as long as it improves your work speed you can take as many naps as you need to okay um which i love that idea i in principle i love that idea just knowing that i often wake up from a nap with like severe cognitive impairment <laughs> like it takes me an hour to get right after a nap 
I mean, a lot of Japanese toilets are coming west, so mm. some people might know this, but the toilets sing for you. Oh, that's um, all I've ever wanted. Japanese toilets are amazing. They're complicated to get, you know, a handle on, especially if you have uh, to use the I bathroom right away. But if you if you check out a Japanese toilet, there's so much it offers. You can press a button and the seat will warm up. Mm. Um, it'll also sing to you. Um I mean, now to get a seat in, in, in like America to get a seat warm, you, you usually have to go in right after someone, and that's yeah, you get a warm seat, but then you start thinking about why it's warm, and that's just unpleasant. <laughs> they have a penis festival. Oh, in the Kanemaro Matsuri Festival, okay. uh, it's held every year, and it started in 1969, and it celebrates the penis and fertility. Neat. That's a that's a lot of dicks. <laughs> Um, they, um, so hold on. I feel like we're glossing over the penis right past the old peen festival. Uh, is it like a, what is there more to say? A village wide thing or something? I like think people... it's an international, like a whole global, no, not global, but like a countrywide festival. They probably have different, um, penis festivals like all over different penis floats penis eff- I'm, I'm picturing like a macy's day parade with just a giant cock floating through you know tokyo uh spoiler alert oh <laughs> just kidding um <laughs> uh and um fruit is the best gift that you can give <gasps> some fruit can be as expensive as twenty seven thousand dollars wow if you give oh, like a square water- watermelon i know they have square, they have square water- melons yeah. yep um not to be confused with penises. No, square penises. <laughs> um, put a, uh, well, we should probably stop talking about penises. It's trying to, I could go off. Like trying it. to put a square peen in a round puss. <laughs> you can rent a cuddle. So you can hire somebody to cuddle you. Mm. There are some businesses where, um, you know, as a team building exercise, they bring in people to cuddle. The people that are privileged uh, you know, they, they, it's a great honor to be someone who is hired to cuddle. Oh, um, okay. Yep. And there are about 1,500 earthquakes a year. That must be an interesting screening process for cuddling. Oh, the cuddling? Yeah. I mean, do you have to go through like a series Probably. of increasing cuddle scenarios? Like, and, you know, okay, this a young person, they've just failed their second test in a row. And they're worried about their future. Cuddle them. Yeah. I mean, oh, your cuddles soothe me. You should be a cuddler. Uh, why not? Right. I, I mean, I if can it, think of a few reasons helpful, why not. <laughs> I think if it helps people. Uh, sure. If it helps and if it's, you know, in a in a an environment and a culture where that can take place without too much creepy shit happening. So I just wanted to share with you a little bit. Of sure. Um, some, you know, wild and interesting facts about Japan before we got into um, the the love of horror and the darkness mm. um, of the Japanese interest Which is, in horror. It's often so um, jarring to me that uh, so much of the, the forward-facing pop culture of Japan, at least to the outsider, it seems to be, you know, bright and poppy and cheerful and colorful. Uh, but their sensibilities in horror are just magnificent. I mean, they 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 created such iconic, genre-defining, dark, dark explorations um, in horror that you know. And then you, you pop over the channel, and it's it's pop idols and mascots. Mm. Um, it's just a wonderful dichotomy in their culture, and which I think is a real honesty of the human condition. It's very expressive. They're yeah. expressing the wide range of emotion, fear, excitement. I mean, they're definitely, you know, finding ways to express themselves, um, maybe not through conversations with people in their family, but through creative arts, yeah. creative means. It's, um, it, it's always refreshing to me to see a culture um, – <clears throat> Be honest with its humanity, you know, like the the Mexican celebration Dia de los Muertes, you know, um, los muertos, um, you know, not being afraid of the dead, of death, of accepting that it's a part of life and of mingling with it and integrating it into your life. That's it's something I, I admire about certain cultures. Um, sorry, it was a bit of a tangent. 
What are you going to talk about? Uh, well, do you want me to yeah. get started? Sure. Um, so I thought I could get started with sort of the evolution of um, representation and horror in, in Japanese film. So like I said earlier, most people, myself included, probably became familiar with Japanese horror in the late 90s, early 2000s with films like The Ring, Ringu, um, uh, The Grudge, Juon. Um, these were hugely popular. I'm going to talk about Ringu later. Yeah, and they were hugely popular in Japan internationally, and they, they really became a sensation in the United States, a lot of them being remade only a few years or, uh, later, um, some of them being remade by the original Japanese directors, just in uh, American productions. But the Japanese had been making horror movies um, for many decades before that. Now, before the sort of new wave renaissance um, of like The Ring and, and The Grudge and, and all that, uh, most Japanese horror movies were called um, kaigan, which translates roughly to weird stories. They mostly were period pieces coming from the Edo period, um, which is roughly the... 1603 to 1867 is that period of time. So think, you know, samurai, um, bow and arrow, katana, uh, wandering bandits, villages, things like that. So a lot of these were folk tales. They were um, morality tales, um, tales of vengeful ghosts righting wrongs, um, spirits wandering the forest and luring people to their doom. Uh, this was a time of there were of warfare of uh, rival clans and shogunates fighting each other. So there were a lot of deserters turned bandits, and a lot of these stories were about you know women who had been brutalized by a, a dishonorable, disgraced samurai, and then coming back as a vengeful ghost, ghost to wreak their vengeance on all samurai. Um, so it, it has its origin in Japanese theater, particularly two types of theater. No. Theater, which um, was theater for like the samurai and the aristocracy, started in the 14th century and it's very famous for using masks and changing masks for expressions. So when you think of those sort of like sam those scary samurai masks, um, that's like no theater style. And then kabuki theater, which I think I I'm certainly more familiar with than no, came about in the six 17th century, and that is known for its lavish costumes and face paints. They didn't use masks in Kabuki, but they used a lot of paint. But they do use extreme expression yes. of the face in Kabuki theater, as opposed to using a mask that has an extreme facial expression. That's the thing ab about Kabuki is um, the shows are very lo long mm -hmm. and they're very loud. They are over the top. They're expressive. They involve a lot of shouting, a lot of noises, clapping, clanging, uh, symbols, things like that. And these are, are stories of, you know, yokai and oni, which are ghosts and demons. Uh, their story of, you know, wandering samurai and vengeful ghosts and things like that. So these all came together and influenced the early Japanese movie, uh, horror movies, which were mostly period films. Um, some of the, the classics of the genre that I, I highly, highly recommend, uh, movies like Koroneko, Onibaba, um, Kwaidan, uh, and those are kind of Edo period pieces about, you know, like vengeful uh, spirits and whatnot. And then um, there are, are, are some, some later films in the 60s and early 70s like Jigoku and Haosu, which um, show a, a level of, of intensity and gore that was not really possible in the United States. Jigoku especially is... Um, a film from 1960, which translates to Sinners of Hell. And it's a very surreal tale of uh, Buddhist interpretations of punishment and, and hell and atonement. Mm. Um, it's really actually more about atonement than punishment. The Catholic version of hell is like justice, whereas the Buddhist version of hell is atoning for your sins. Was there a way out? Essentially, yes, there were different levels. And if you read deeply into the Bible and kind of move past modern interpretations... There is actually a way out of hell, too. Jesus, after the resurrection, descended into hell to rescue, you know, spirits that had paid their penance. Um, that's kind of been forgotten, I think, over the years. But hell was, as originally conceived by most cultures, 
it wasn't really a place you were supposed to stay forever. Um, Hades is a bit different. Uh, but anyway, so uh, um, something changed uh, in, in, in Japanese sensibility. And I, I've always argued that horror movies give you such an insight into a culture because it, it shows you what most of the people are f- afraid of at the time that, that the movies film. So in the 50s and 60s, a lot of movies moved into fears of atomic horrors, of nuclear power. Pretty obvious why Japan mm-hmm. is the only country on earth that's ever been uh, attacked with nuclear weapons. Um, so you get movies like Godzilla um, about nature that's been tainted by radiation and, and mm-hmm. goes out of control and wreaks vengeance on humans. But, sea monster. Well, one of the most interesting of that time period is a, is a film called Matango, where a shipwrecked crew um, find these strange mushrooms on this island. It's the only food they can find, and they eat it, and it's like kind of turns them into fungus monsters. But it was quite controversial at the time because the uh, the makeup and effects were purposefully made to really resemble radiation burns. Oh gosh! Um, so it 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 it's a it's a it's it's a bit of a silly movie. I mean, they turn into mushroom monsters, but given the context of of the still very fresh, you know, only 15-year-old trauma, it it, it permeates all levels of Japanese filmmaking at this time period. Mm. Um, Now... That is frightening. That moves us into the more modern era. And in that, you see a real shift away from um, period pieces into modern times and the focus is on what scares us now and it's loneliness Mm -hmm. isolation and technology so you have you know sadako coming out of the uh television in the ring you have um cairo pulse which is about ghosts uh coming through the 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 then very new internet um so uh, if you watch a lot of um modern horror from from japan you get a lot of themes of isolation, social disconnection, loneliness, and curses, things that follow people. It like a, a cycle that can't be broken, um, a generation, you know, like the something that's passed on, or a a home that has been so tainted by violence that it it's now evil, and I, you know that's like allegedly the um, Amityville horror. Yeah, that's. The folklore around it, whether it's true or not, is, you know, anybody's interpretation of, but... The cool thing about a, pl- a place like Japan, though, is a haunted An anime location... An holding, you know... Yes, yes. Well, there is, you know, the, 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 the Shintoist, the Shinto religion, which, you know, holds the belief that, that uh, objects have, have spirits to them, um, but it went in a country as ancient... As Japan, which has had such a vibrant culture for as long as it's had, haunted houses there don't have ghosts from forty years ago. They have ghosts from a thousand years oh, ago. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's it's a, a land of of history, and any land of history is one that's also soaked in blood. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely, as Japan certainly is. Um, so that's my little little walk through movies, and and we'll get into some of our favorites when we later on in the episode when we do recommendations but that's my my through the years well i wanted to talk through about the years <laughs> we watch horror had. movies oh, i thought we were really singing Sorry. my song um that's great because i'm going to talk about um both the celebration of horror in japan so how they celebrate horror oh cool and also i like where they go and what the stories are, just a few, of quote-unquote living horror, these inanimate objects having, um, holding some kind of uh, demon or, yeah, or fear. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. S- I, I love that idea of celebrating horror, of accepting that fear, death, and and, and those things are, you can never eliminate them from life. They're They're integral to life. So is it better to pretend like they don't exist and bury your head in the sand, wait for them to catch up to you? Or is it better to put on a costume and shout in its face and yell your defiance 
of the things or that, celebrate that, that scare it. you. Celebrate yeah. that there's this Make long it into a party. history of something that it frightens people and there's a reason for it. It's it's a, a celebration of the culture. It doesn't just have to be all of the positive. It can be some of the frightening. And it should be. I think when you eliminate the negativity and the fear and, and whatnot from your, your national story, you get uh, very inaccurate and potentially yeah, dangerous it's, it's, propaganda. Yeah, or you're like you know, washing history when it doesn't need to be. Um, so what I wanted to talk about were a few of the many haunted places throughout Japan. Oh, see, Notably you're... haunted places throughout Japan where people from all over the world and within the country go to, um, to either get fear or overcome a fear or they're fascinated by it. Overcome a fear. That's something I hadn't considered. Of course. Interesting. Sometimes you, you know, jump out of a plane because you're no, afraid of heights. I, like, of I, I get that. I just, I had, I guess I had never considered purposefully going to a haunted place to overcome some fears. Uh, that's not an angle I had thought of. And that's intriguing to me. Well, the first um, place I want to talk about is the Okigahara Forest. Oh, yes, of course. Which is the suicide forest. Yeah, I think so, we, I think a lot of people have probably heard about that. Yeah, this is sad, but also you know a place that holds a lot of um, memory. And I think one thing about Japanese culture that I've learned is that memory is something that they carry with them. Certainly, yeah. Um, so the forest is disturbingly silent, which adds to its sort of appeal or repeal like in terms of wildlife and just like yes. the natural sounds you yes. hear and oh wow creepy yeah and it's difficult for the sun to penetrate through the canopy of trees because they're yeah. so tightly it's grown. an ancient forest yeah it's been called the suicide forest because this is where hundreds of people have committed suicide mm. so one of the um bits of information about japan is they do have a very high suicide rate yeah um which is probably in response to what many people feel, um, not just the Japanese, but that sense of loneliness you mentioned earlier, these these tropes that are in contemporary sure, I mean, horror, I mean, in loneliness a, in a, and fear. In a very and... short amount of time, they went from a, an imperial power to a conquered nation, the only country that had been devastated by atomic power. They gave up their military. They had their constitution rewritten by other people. It's it's I, a I lot to these go through. Embracing this these um, fear based um, areas and horror, uh, scary haunted places as a way to regain control over their culture, regain control over their environment. You know, Certainly. and it's something that yeah. you can't take it away because we're going to continue to keep it alive. Um, the it, government's put warning signs throughout the forest, the suicide forest, to prevent suicides and give them information on how to, you know, solicit help. Oh, like resources? Yes. And, that's good. Um, it was also, the suicide forest was also used to practice uh, ubasa, u- ubatse. What's that? Um, it's a practice of leaving an old woman to die in the forest oh. where her soul then haunts the woods. Yikes. Um, so does it have to be an old woman? Cause yes. could you do that with me? Or just pick like a fun place. Like <laughs> next... leave me outside, you know, I don't know. It's a place I like. The next very notable, um, haunted place that I wanted to talk about is called the Oirin Bochi. Please it, pardon Oirin our Bucci? Western tongues. No, I, I phonetically. You're, you're doing good. Okay. Oirin Bochi. Yeah. Nice. I phonetically sounded this out. Oiren Bucci, it's the Wailing Women. Mm. The Oiren Bucci is a bridge that's said to have haunt, been haunted since the 16th century. Legend has it that when the Takeda clan, clan were running gold mines in the area, they would bring in prostitutes to keep the miners happy. Oh. And on the way out, the clan would kill all the prostitutes so they wouldn't share the information about the mines and all the gold that they were um, mining. They did this by inviting them to cross the bridge and then slashing the ropes of the bridge. So it's, Wait, is this a legend or did this really happen? 
Well, it's said that you can hear the wails and cries of the women from the gorge below Dear whenever God. you cross the Oiren Bochi Bridge. I, you know, you don't have to say anything about it. It's okay to just let God. it live. But just a little aside. Why not show gratitude to a prostitute? Like, didn't you just have like a great time doing what you wanted to do? Then, like, say thank you, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Um, and then the last haunted place I want to talk about is the Naka Guzinku mm-hmm. Hotel, which is also known as the Haunted Ruins. <laughs> it's a decrepit hotel. I booked hotel us a, a luxury suite it's at the Haunted a, Ruins. It's not, you can't sleep there. Not in use. It's a decrepit hotel of ruins. It was supposed to be a luxury resort near the, the same named castle. So mm-hmm. there's a Naka guzuku okay castle um the original construction was opposed by a monk in the area because there were sacred burial grounds and he vowed to disturb the graves and the uh, the hotel site forever huh. um if they continued with the construction um and construction was started anyway and then during construction, several mishaps, multiple deaths of both construction workers and planners uh, caused the project to stop. And then the owner of the hotel project said, I, I need to get this done. You know, and he said, I'm going to go in. I'm going to prove it's not cursed. I'm going to go and sleep in the hotel overnight, and I'm going to make sure that Everyone in the town and surrounding area know that this is not anything to be afraid of. Well, he did sleep there. And then the next day he returned to the town talking nonsense and just nobody could understand what he was raving about, raging about. And then he disappeared, never to be seen again. And so today people can go visit the ruins and they say they can see lights come on at night and feel like a cold, ghostly like presence among all of the empty corridors of the ruins. So the monk was right. (laughs) Yeah, man, that is. um, I mean, I can understand if you're in the middle of a big project and a crazy monk comes out of the woods and starts cursing you, you probably still go ahead with your plans. Um. But maybe hind- you shouldn't. Yeah. Next time hindsight is wow. Yeah. I mean, if you just listened to the monk. Right. You probably would have saved yourself it's a, a lot of money. Public service announcement for our listeners. Uh, if you're working on something and a monk comes out of the woods and starts screaming at you. I'm not saying stop, but maybe like pause for the day and reconsider. <gasps> Speaking of pausing, Ooh. why don't we take a commercial break? As I, may, I didn't even plan that. been a long road to growing the perfect clone and a bumpy one at that sure you've made mistakes the path to greatness requires breaking a few clone eggs after all but now that you've got your genetically identical assistant in place the question remains what to do with all the hideous corpses of your failures well why not call boys from brazil clone disposal using our patented clonoscopy procedure We'll terminate and extract any remaining biomass from your life tubes, leaving behind a clean lab with a fresh lavender scent. At Boys from Brazil Clone Disposal, all of our equipment is powered by biofuel. (laughs) We use every part of the discarded clone meats to keep our carbon footprint neutral. Or, for an added fee, we can render your discarded husks down into nutrients for your viable experiments. So skip the muss, skip the fuss, Skip the staring into your own face as you navigate the murky ethics of purging your infant duplicates. Call Boys from Brazil Clone Disposal, and let us sweep up your malformed homunculi under the rug so you can get back to mocking God. This is a fake ad for a fake product on a horror-themed podcast. Do not clone humans, or hire people to dispose of the cloned humans you should not have made. 
Welcome back. Hi, everyone, again. All right. Uh, we're here. Um, I wanted to, so, you know, I did just talk to you all about some of the haunted places, but I want to talk more about the celebration of all things yes. frightening. I want to talk about that, too. That sounds awesome. Um, because the Japanese have such a rich storytelling history, they do embrace the horror aspect just as they do with all other aspects, and mm-hmm. they celebrate it. So if you're telling a story about life and you cut out fear and horror, sure. you're not telling a story about real life. The first place I want to talk about is called fuji Q Highland. Cool. It's a popular amusement park in Fujiyoshida in the Yamanshi Prefecture. Uh-huh. It's best known for high-speed roller coasters and f- the fright-inducing labyrinth of fear. Wow. The labyrinth is widely known as the largest and most terrifying haunted house in all of Japan. Oh my god. <laughs> the setting is an abandoned hospital where, according to legend, it was used to perform cruel human experiments. You know, that's the great thing about cruel human experiments is once you're done with them, you can just reuse the space for haunted attractions. <laughs> it's it's like recycling. It takes almost an hour to complete the labyrinth of fear. Ooh. It's a maze. And by complete, do you mean survive? <laughs> well, it's a maze, so you need to find your own way out. Uh-huh. And it's one of the top scary places to visit in Japan. Oh, my God. That's You're going to notice a little bit of, of a theme list. here. Here's, there's, so there, in, there's another. Is the theme horror? No. <laughs> is, it, is it Japan? <laughs> no. There's another amusement park. So they have so many amusement parks. Oh, and yeah. all of their amusement parks have multiple fear-based attractions oh and God. amusements. See, this is a culture that just makes sense to I me. I mean, we can only experience, you know, like uh, Not Scary Farm or, you know, when Halloween Horror like Nights. Fright Fest at Six Flags or something like that. Yeah. You know, it's only really once a year. Yeah, it's, it's not Halloween. all the time. And exactly. maybe they have like a haunted mansion or a haunted hotel, but... It, this it does is seem really like a it's focus. Res- in the West, it does seem like it's reserved for Selwyn. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the other amusement park I want to talk about is called Hana'a Shiki. It's Jap- Japan's oldest amusement park. It's over 150 years old. Oh, wow. That's neat. There are three different haunted attractions there, like super popular. Sakura no Onoru is the most popular one. It's where a woman is trapped as a spirit of the Sakura tree, which is cut down during what well, which was cut down during the construction of the amusement park. So they basically built in this alleged spirit that while they built the amusement park, they unearthed the spirit and now she haunts this attraction. Um you Wait, wa- the, the so tra- they were excavating to build this thing and they found a yeah. body? No. And that like It was like they cut down this ancient tree, the Sakura uh-huh. tree, uh-huh. and it's said to have had released oh, a spirit. Oh, 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 ooh. So you walk through the dark down a narrow passage while encountering ghosts and scary Japanese dolls in kimono. Oh, my God. <laughs> Did you say dolls? Yes, dolls. Oh, Wow. Um, and then finally, um, in Tokyo, uh, there is the Daiba Haunted School. It's in the Tokyo Beach Seaside Mall. What the? <laughs> the setting is an old <laughs> elementary school, and you have to make your way out by solving mysteries and completing missions in order to save the spirits of the students that have passed before you. So you get like an orange Julius <laughs> and hit up the, the the haunted escape room? Yeah, it's this escape room that you have to outsmart and hide. Um, there are also other escape rooms that there's a murderer in the house and you have to try to survive the night. Uh, not a real murderer, allegedly, but <laughs> I don't know. Wow. Um, and so most amusement parks, like I said, include several haunted rides or experiences. Would it be quicker if we just listed the places in Japan that aren't haunted? <laughs> well, now my final um, just dive is going to be talking about the horror themed festivals and events. And there are a lot of them. And I only picked a couple. And you know, we're 
going to have to go to Japan yeah. at some point. I mean, we could, I've, like, I've never always even wanted to go. that it could be an entire horror themed yeah. vacation. I didn't either. This is a new level for me. I mean, I've wanted to visit Japan since I was 17 years old. Uh, but yeah, I, there's just, this is like wow. the, the Japan that I never dreamed or nightmared. Yeah. Um, so every October, the Kyoto Yokie Parade. It's a parade from the world of spirits, including demons and the yokie. Um, it takes place in Kyoto. Everyone wears masks and costumes of the hiakie. Guo? Juo? What are those? Um, it's a legend of mythical troublemakers. Oh, okay. So they so, just like, dance around and... and wear all these like uh, frightening masks and I love... Isn't that spirits. cool that like... You know, you know that the ancient Japanese and the Irish didn't have contact with each other, but they both developed the, these sort of like trickster yeah. gremlins, like Iceland as well, the the, the elves and, and all that. Like, it's, I guess, ingrained in humanity that when unexplained things in your life start to go wrong, you just think, oh, it must be fucking gremlins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's also the Namahagi. Namahagi. Okay. It's a New Year's ritual. In the Oga Peninsula of Akita. It's a festival that focuses on the power of Oni, which are mm, brutish yeah. demons um, who are very popular throughout folklore. Yeah, they're have you ever seen a, a representation? Villains. They're big yeah. and they kind of look like sumo wrestlers a little bit with robes. Yeah. yeah. So they're like big ogres. And so these men, this is the and festival. They, I think they have tusks or like fangs or something. Yeah. Um, these men dress up. Like angry, brightly colored oni masks and straw capes, and they run around the festival with wooden knives and they call out children who are badly behaved to the streets and yell at them and scare them and chase them. So, you know, I'm sure the parents of the kids are like, oh, you have to, you know, call out my son or daughter. (laughs) So there's a Netflix show about like cute little kids going to the pharmacy to get stuff. Oh, it's so adorable. Why can't there be a Netflix show about creepy middle-aged men putting masks on and screaming and waving wooden knives around at the village kids? Yeah, maybe there will be. Maybe there is. Yeah. Um, and then the final. We had a uh, guy like that in my town. <laughs> the final event I wanted to talk about is called Pontu. It happens on the island of um, Mioka Jima, mm-hmm. like Hiwa Jima, but Mioka Jima. Okay. Um, in Okinawa. Okay. And villagers dress as mythical Pontu. Um, holding wooden masks and wearing cloak covered in mud and leaves. So it's like mud covered oh, leaves. Oh, yeah. So really naturalistic. Yeah, they like, spread their mud neat. on their faces and um, they go after people. And if you don't run away fast enough, they spread mud on your face. Oh, so it's no. basically like you didn't get escape yeah. the pontu. Oh, gosh. Um, and the intention is to spread luck and scare evil away. And mud. And mud is also spread on all new buildings in order to sort of give it um, luck in the future Neat. of, you know, law, staying built for long and having yeah, success yeah. Well, if it's a new business. That, that you've built an artificial edifice on top of the earth by rubbing earth on it. You're, you're kind of, I don't know, it's a, more of a symbiosis that way. Yeah. I love that. I mean, they celebrate horror, and yeah. just like our podcast. I feel like you know? I was, uh, not for the first time, maybe born in the wrong country. Well, I mean, we, I'm not going to get into that, you know, all of that, but I do think that it's really wonderful uh, to understand a culture through what frightens them as well, through their folklore of fear, because they do celebrate that. Yeah. They celebrate everything of where they came well, from. Well, I used to... So every week, I used to have to go to a place to listen to terrifying stories about evil and how rotten I was and how, you know, I was going to go to hell for seemingly minor infractions. And it was called Sunday School. Um, but imagine instead if the uh, Namahagi was, you know, uh, celeb- calling you out in the middle of the street and be- chasing you around. 
I mean, that, that's, I guess that's a different, <laughs> different a, type, I guess different I, type I, of trauma. I'd be telling my therapist a different story <laughs> at that point. Yeah. So um, I thought maybe you could talk about some film. I only have one film that I'm going to talk uh, in depth about. Listen, and I one gotcha. that I'm not going to talk in depth about, but that is a really amazing film. And for um, specific reasons, I just don't feel comfortable I, promoting I, it. I have a quick request. Before, okay. c- can we end on film? And I just want to do a brief little thing. Oh, I didn't on, know you had anything I else. do. Oh, I've always... Listen... When it comes to Japanese horror, days and days. Um, Sorry, audience. <laughs> me too. Um, I, uh, I I came by Japanese horror um, through Akira Kurosawa, of all people. I, um, I was 17 years old. I came home late from my after-school job and popped on the TV, and there was the, a movie on. I just was watching was ever, ever was on. It was The Seven Samurai. Uh, I caught maybe the last hour of it, and it literally changed my life. Um, I started seeking out voraciously all bits of Japanese culture I could, which led me to, um, you know, this was in the 90s, so it was around the time The Ring came out. And once I discovered Hideo Nakata and The, and the Ring, um, that was it for me. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the, the tradition of manga. Um, oh, good. Because I was wondering if you were going to talk about I was going to bring it up earlier and be like, didn't these start out as manga? Well, so- manga is... Um, essentially Japanese comic books. They are enormously popular um, to, a, to a level that is almost hard to fathom sometimes. Uh, and they have, over the past 10, 15 years or so, really made a huge splash in, in, in Western culture as well. Um, go into any chain bookstore now and they have entire manga sections mm-hmm. that are massive. Um, now, manga, Japanese comics, it's, it, it, there are tons and tons of horror comics. Berserk is, is, a, is a classic. Um, Parasite is another one I, I really enjoy. Vampire Hunter D. Akira is an, a, a, an anime that um, is just seminal. But I'm going to talk about a particular artist and writer named Junji Ito. Now, Junji Ito is just the master of deeply disturbing manga um he's like the japanese lovecraft in many ways minus the problematic uh hatred of immigrants um now junji ito my favorite of, of, of his works is called uzumaki which translates to spirals um he's also written gyo uh tomi um there's a new anthology an animated anthology is coming to netflix next year based on the works of junji ito and i am crazy excited about that he, he just writes in a way that is it, it's it's truly horrific um i don't know if it's scary jump out of your seat type stuff but it it gives you nightmares it certainly does and it's the kind of thing that you'll find yourself thinking about it days later uh it, like it really that. really works its way into I like your things get under my skin yes That's anything by junji ito is is worth it literally anything but if you pick uh, one i i am very fond of uzumaki it was turned into a film in 2001 that was okay um it did a pretty good job showing some of the really surreal uh visual elements in the horror but it's a it's it's an anthology manga so it's kind of hard to form a cohesive narrative out of it essentially it's a town that is plagued by spirals and I'm just going to leave That's it at that. That's a big theme, actually, in horror. Yeah. Spirals. Yeah. Oh, in absolutely. Japanese horror. Well, I mean, in all sorts. There was a movie called Spiral just came out with Chris Rock. It was the, the latest uh, Saw movie. Yeah, and I think that might have been based on manga. Interesting. Um, now, you know. Uh, not, or, adjacent not the to actual that? movie, but like, I think. Well, wait, the concept. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I remember in, you remember the music video for Jeremy by Pearl Jam where of he's just drawing course. the circle over and over and over and over. Yeah. Um, no, it's an uncomfortable video about an uncomfortable subject that 25 years later we have not improved on. Um, so adjacent to manga and anime are video games. Now, the mm. Japanese, obviously well known for pioneering, you know, a, a, a video games and taking them to, to a, a whole nother level. Um, but they, it should come as no surprise that horror plays 
quite frequently into their video games, but possibly the most well-known series being Resident Evil, um, which uh, there's also the Dark Souls games. Um, but what there's definitely a, a, a particular vibe that separates a, a Japanese horror game from a Western horror game. Uh, they tend to be very fantastical and grand. And um, what has always struck me about some of the masters of, of Japanese horror, like Silent Hill, uh, The Evil Within, are the, the creature designs and the environmental designs are just next level disturbing. Um, they, they, they're, there's such a mastery of creating environment and ambiance and sound design. I'm a big fan of Japanese horror games. And then there's sort of the opposite end of the spectrum where it's just really over the top and excessive and bombastic. And that's fun, too. Um, so, it, you know, check out the Dark Souls games. Elden Ring, um, while maybe not specifically a horror game itself, is certainly permeated throughout with, with horrific creature designs and whatnot. You know what? I'm calling maybe it. Maybe you'll meet a It is a horror too. game. Um, oh, I think we, we should do some some video game uh a video game centric episode at some point yeah as soon but... as you let me play and buy me the quarry, <laughs> the so quarry. we gotta play it. the quarry um but it just it must be said that the 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 jap the japanese um game developers like capcom koei tecmo um nintendo even uh, they've really furthered the genre and taken it into a direction that I'm not sure Western audiences would have been capable of, and it's clear how much it has influenced Western video game culture uh, over the decades. Sure. It's really, really cool. So uh, do you want to do our like notable Yes. I know that we've covered an awful lot in this episode, so I, I think it would be helpful if you and I just maybe threw out a couple top of the pops that yeah. if, you, if you just got time to watch a few movies – Check these out first, and it might might start a love affair with you. And, well, and you've Japanese already horror. mentioned the um, Juwan, which is the Grudge, also known as the Grudge. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, one miss call. Is that your Hashimike. first? That's your first me- recommendation. It's not a recommendation. I'm just going to talk <laughs> about notable notable hey, listen, horror. If you're going to start with Takashi Miike, you have my hundred percent respect. Um, it's, that man <laughs> is a dark genius it's a about about uh the message of death through cell phones essentially Mm -hmm. so as richard mentioned earlier they do contemporary horror based off of their fears and technology is one of their fears you know technology taking over having a mind of its own and so this is sort of one of the ways in which that appears the other um sort of recommendation impression film is Ringu which you mentioned mm, yes the, the ring, ring from 1998 it's supernatural psychological horror um directed by uh Hideo Nakata H- Hideo Nakata Hideo Nakata mm-hmm. based on the 1991 um manga I think or movie was I, it a I think it was a novel if I'm novel, not mistaken yeah, by Koju Suzuki yes um it stars Maybe you can help. Um, Actually, I think it, it, most uh, Western audiences would be familiar with I want to talk about star. him. I want to talk about okay, him. Okay, so it, it stars Hiro, yes, Hiroyuki no, Sanada. Yes. So uh, Sanada is uh, from Lost. An extremely handsome um, man. He's been in a lot, of, a lot of shows. He was in Wolverine. He was in Lost. He was in Mortal Kombat. He was in Sunshine. And he's in the new Bullet Train movie. And Avengers Endgame. An Avengers Endgame. Yeah, he's awesome. He's awesome. Very recognizable. Anyway, just the essential of uh, Ringu, because I do think it's important to know. So a reporter named Raiko is looking into a curse video that teenagers are saying um, is causing their deaths. And when her niece suddenly dies of, quote unquote, heart failure, um, and she has a horrified expression on her face, and I'm going to get into that in a second, she and her ex, played by Sonata, um, investigate this. They discover that the viewer has seven days after watching it, and she watches it at a cabin that was, uh, you know, the teens stayed at before their death. 
and uh, things basically become a race to find out. Well, you let you forgot what happens right after you finish watching the video. The phone rings. Yep. You get a phone call. You get a phone call of you t- telling it's you talking about your death. It's basically your death rattle. Your your own voice yes. telling you that you're about to die. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you have seven days from that point. And so they, uh, while they're investigating, they discover the connection to a mysterious child, Sadako, right? Sadako. Sadako. Mm-hmm. Um, the coming out of the well scene yep. was accomplished with exaggerated and jerking movements to emphasize emotions. And that was provided by a student of the Kabuki theater, mm. which is what those movements convey in Kabuki theater. And also yes. the horrific expressions on the face yes. is another part of the original Kabuki or the no, the no right. uh, masks. Yes. Yeah. So that what which often symbolize death or pain or, or um, violence of some kind. That's the wonderful thing about even the, the the modernization of Japanese horror is still so heavily influenced by what came before, and it still incorporates. It's the cool thing about Japan is you'll see you know modern buildings and designs right next to a, you know something from from the Edo Rome period. Is very much like that. As yeah, well. just the old coexisting with the new, creating that 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 anachronism it's almost that, a confusion for your mind yeah exactly you, you you're you're struggling to put yourself in a time and a place because it's like you're existing simultaneously across multiple timelines mm-hmm. that's uh, something i find so fascinating about as an american our our western american culture is quite young so you know coming examining a, a, a thousands year old culture like japan we get so many stories and points of view that are not than our own. But they're not possible for us right. because we haven't been here long enough. Yeah. Um, and then I just want to mention Battle Royale. Yeah. It's a very sensitive subject area. Of, um, it, it, it involves children, violence against children in, in a school environment. So I didn't want to go into it just because it's not anything I want to talk about right now or on the podcast. But... I would be remiss to not mention this film because it is an amazing film um, with a very sensitive subject, but it is ultimately a horror. And it's a, I mean, The Hunger Games is a ripoff of Battle Royale. Oh, it's the reason I didn't like The Hunger Games because as soon as that came it out, it is like, I'm like... A, uh, there are maybe two major themes that differ, but for the most part, it is essentially the same. Um, so it's essentially the Japanese Hunger Games for those of you who and put the rest of that together yes, yourself. But exactly, th- it should be noted that this was film. This was a Japanese story where they do not have the mass shootings that we have. This was done in the year two thousand, and it was very much a commentary on the pressures and the unfair and unrealistic pressures that are put on to students and also simultaneously students and the younger generation frightening the older generation with their mm-hmm. new ways. Right. Um, now yeah, it, it, was it also... very memorably stars um, uh, Takeshi Kitano as, as the evil uh, principal. He's so good. Now he Takeshi Kitano, uh, known by the nickname Beat Takeshi, is a very famous Japanese uh, director, writer, and actor who primarily did dramas and yakuza films. Um, some of my very favorites. He's one of my favorite creators. Um, but this was one of his only forays into horror, and even then, it was very realistic horror. Yeah. Well, it, it it does deal with... It, it's a very difficult... Just don't, if you're very sensitive... Like, if you love horror, then you probably already know Battle Royale. I would say if you're going to watch any of our recommendations, maybe skip that one. And but just know if you are gonna watch that it, it exists. Keep in mind that it 100% is an intentional satire yes. of... Well, not satire. No, it, it is a satire. It is very much was conceived and shot as a satire. And, and it's as definitely a, not funny. Well, not all satires are funny. It's just pointing out some very important topics and doing it in an, such a in a way that cannot be ignored. Um, it's an excellent film, but given the context of the society we live in and can't seem to escape today, 
understandably, it's not one that I find myself revisiting very often. So me, um, I'm just going to, I'll try to keep this quick. I'm just going to rattle off a couple. Um, now, we've already talked about some of the best. So Takashi Ike is a name that, that came up in one of Laura's recommendations, One Missed Call. Um, Takashi Ike is an extremely prolific filmmaker. He's also quite extreme. Um, his movies can be uh, pretty over the top in the, in terms of violence. So definitely a lot of noise, slashing, and visual, and really hard to watch stuff. Like I had to keep my eyes closed for a lot. So, so I'm just telling some people of who his are movies. Very sensitive to well, that. he's made a lot of different kinds of movies. He's made um, period pieces that are quite reserved and samurai tales. Um, he did, and uh, uh, you know, he's done splatter, Welcome disgusting gore movies. He's done. Of- Samurai Tales. Yeah. He's done Yakuza films. But um, the one that I'm going to recommend is possibly his most disturbing. And it is not one of his most over-the-top bombastic. It's it's it's, But it is disturbing. It's called Audition. Mm. Now, Audition is the tale of a, a wealthy, successful Japanese businessman who his friends convince him. He's looking for a wife. His friends convince him to put an ad out in the paper for like the perfect woman that he's looking for. And it's very sexist. Um, And someone answers that. And let's just say it's his worst fucking nightmare. Mm -hmm. Now the woman who answers this ad breaks this man down. And it is Takashi Miike in a lot of his films. He's so over the top and so bombastic and splattery and like almost ridiculous. Not in this movie. In this movie, he is patient, deliberate, and merciless um and what i mean by that is the camera does not shy away um even the implications when he doesn't show you what's going on are are just stomach churning so it's a tough one but i'd be remiss if i didn't mention it because it is one of the greatest japanese horror movies ever made after audition for something a little lighter than that i really recommend a, a, a newer film from the past few years called one cut of the dead Now, One Cut of the Dead has already been remade by a French filmmaker. I believe it's being remade by an American filmmaker. I haven't watched it. Just watch the original. It's on Shudder. It's pretty easy to find. The thing about One Cut of the Dead is it's about... um, it's, It's... Ostensibly on the surface, it's about an independent filmmaker trying to shoot a low budget zombie movie and things go wrong. Now, the movie is absolutely not what you expect it to be does a head turn about halfway through that completely changes the nature of the movie. And it is an absolute celebration of genre filmmaking, of nerds, of scrappy independent filmmakers. It is hilariously funny. It's gory, but not disturbing. It's just, it's a really rollicking good time and when they were screening this at festivals audiences went nuts for it it was you know famous for people cheering and you know it's just it's a really good time it's got enough horror in there to satisfy you know the the horror hounds but you can be a non-horror fan and get really into this movie because once you once they reveal what's really going on it's it's more of a a good time than anything else it sounds like like a tucker and dale type yeah, a little bit. Zombieland um, type. A little bit. It's it's but there's such a purity and a joy to this um that I think you only get from like just people, you know, underdogs doing their best trying to make them and I think all filmmaking is is a story of people just coming together and making an impossible thing mm-hmm. that shouldn't exist. Um so one cut of the dead now, my last recommendation is a found footage film. Oh. It's probably the least known on this list, but boy, oh boy. I mean, I guess one. Ringu could be considered found footage. But not the movie itself. No. Now, this movie is, it's a fake documentary called Noroi the Curse. It's N-O-R-O-I colon the curse. Now, Noroi is about a, um, a skeptic academic brings the documentary team into a village to investigate, you know, supernatural goings on. Um, Like we said, uh, you know, 
earlier, in, in a culture this ancient, there are parts of the country that still are not, you know, fully industrial. This is more true in places like uh, Indonesia and China, where it's so vast. But, you know, parts of the country that still cling uh, to ancient traditions, um, and that is a real juxtaposition with how quickly Japan modernized and industrialized, in, in, in um, especially in the 70s and 80s. So it is, um, it's a bit of a slow burn, this film. Things really start to creep in, and it has one of the scariest finales uh, to a movie that I think I've maybe ever seen. I was breathless at the end of this movie. And it's a real... I had to resuscitate it. <laughs> it's a real classic scare. It's, it's one of those things that long after the movie's over, you're still staring mm. at the screen going what oh god what just uh, am i okay it's um it's not super gory or or like splattery or disturbing i think uh, even a casual fan can get into it like i said it's a bit of a slow burn but it's worth it one subgenre of japanese horror that i didn't touch on and, and it's purposeful is they they have a um a very large popular and and pervasive exploitation side to their horror um and the reason I didn't get into this is it's just not really my style. Um, these are not necessarily narratively coherent movies. They're really more exercises in grossing you out. And their filmmakers are very open about that. I'm, that's not a commentary. The, the point of these is to be as extreme and disgusting as possible and then, you know, do more the next time. And, you know, unless it's in service to an interesting story, I... I just have to admit that's not for me. Um, Definitely not for me. No, no. So we, we didn't talk so much about uh, Japanese exploitation, although if you want to get into Japanese body horror, you could check out Tetsuo the Iron Man, which is black and white and really cool. Um, that's not for me. No, but it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a guy who kind of starts turning into a, like a cyborg machine, and it's, it's, it's pretty intense mm. and actually is a movie. Um but we we didn't go into that. If if that is your thing, that's totally fine. It's just it's not ours. Get well, your own podcast. Yeah, exactly. Um, I really hope that even if you're not interested in subtitled films, maybe pick up a uh, manga. Or if you're not interested in um, horror films, maybe there's you know, a uh, folk tale that you might be interested in. Reading. One thing I've discovered about Japanese horror, especially is it's a wonderful gateway to um, Asian horror more generally, but in Southeast Asian horror, um, because Japanese culture is so heavily influenced by American culture that there's still enough familiarity there for someone who doesn't watch a lot of foreign films to, Maybe start with Japan, and then before you know it, you're checking out horror movies from Malaysia and the Philippines. And but even if movies aren't for you, there are a lot of folk tales that you can read into. Oh, a lot yeah. of um, other haunted places, anime, throughout video games, Japan that might interest you to read about and learn about. Travel. So we really hope that you enjoyed this trip to Japan and understanding their celebration of horror through their different festivals. Um, amusement parks, uh, film, manga, and other. And we Arigato really enjoyed for joining us. I really enjoyed the research, and I know little about Japanese um, horror culture, but now I feel like I learned a little bit. And I will continue to work on my pronunciation, and apologies for any of the terrible pronunciation, but I did my best and I I'm, really appreciate your support. So what I'm hearing is there are a lot of movies that you're going to want to watch that I get to watch with you. <laughs> exactly. Yay. Well, we'll see you next time. And see you next time, everybody. You. Sayonara. Terror in Tandem is written, produced, and recorded by Laura and Richard Mathiason, and edited and mixed by Richard Mathiason. Our theme was written and performed by Carrie Denver, and all other music was written and performed by David Zispanik. All opinions expressed on this podcast are our own and should be taken as such. Thanks for listening, and please remember to give us a like, a review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 
See you next time. Where's that?